It's time to accelerate. Hi, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Join me as I host conversations with the leading experts in sales, marketing, sales automation, sales process, leadership, management, training, coaching, any resource that I believe to help you accelerate the growth of your sales, your business, and most importantly, you. Hello, and welcome to Accelerate. Joining me on the show today is Keith Dugdale. He's CEO of the Business of Trust, which is a sales consultancy based in Brisbane, Australia. And you know, we've had a lot of really interesting guests come from Australia on the sales side, a lot of good sales thinking going on there. An author of a book called Smarter Selling, which we're going to talk about on the show. Keith, welcome to Accelerate. Thank you very much, Andy. It's a pleasure to be here. So, pleasure to have you. So, I was serious. I mean, we've had some, <laughs> some really interesting guests, and I urge anybody that's listening to go back and check some of them out with... Uh, Gosh, uh, Tony Hughes, uh, John Smybert, uh, Keen McLaughlin, uh, Peter Strokorb, a few others. Uh, said some people doing some really good leading edge thinking about sales in Australia, of which your was one yeah. as well. Yeah, they're, they're, they're all well. Actually, I think every name you've mentioned there is part of a, a group that we've pulled together here to keep on challenging each other's thinking, I guess, in this space. Excellent. Well, you're doing a good job of it. So, may fill in my introduction a little bit and tell people how you got your start in sales. Um, I'd worked with PwC and the consulting businesses for years around the world, um, and over time, primarily in business development and in uh, actually training roles. And over time, you start to see the patterns between those who are really good at their client relationships and also making uh, serious revenue, and those who aren't. But and, uh, frustrated by the pattern of someone saying, "I'll oh, just go and do what Jane does." But of course, you can't unpick what Jane does because Jane just does it. And so my my mate and I, David, who's based in Hong Kong at the time with PwC, uh, set up a business to try and code the behavior. Um, and the book, we started running programs before the book. And then people started saying, you really should get a book on this stuff because at that stage, it was very different. Um, and so the book got written. Um, we were very fortunate to get one of the best publishers in that space. And the rest, as they say, is history. We've now run consulting in, I think it's 27 countries, um, and have a lot of fun with a lot of great clients. Well, excellent. So, business is called the business of trust. So, do you focus primarily on you know, building trust-based relationships in business and how to you know, expedite you know, sort of <laughs> along the lines of the speed of trust, you know, facilitate economic relationships through trust? Uh, absolutely. So it's, for us, the, the end game has been, well, both the end game and the start game. It is if you focus on helping a client succeed rather than selling something and you help build the trust through helping them succeed, then they will buy from you. So if you want to kind of put two sides of the coin, as opposed to selling something, it's creating an environment where they want to buy from you. Yeah. And you talk about this in your book, you define that really as the I-O-U approach, which is spelled out I-O-W-E-U approach to selling. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I may explain that just a little bit further for the people listening. Yeah, the, the whole notion is that if you think about the way that many salespeople behave, it's, it, they take control. So, it's almost as if they, you know, the, the, the customer actually owes them. Whereas what we're trying to do is, is to get salespeople into that mindset that I, as the salesperson, owe you, as the customer, everything. Because you're already committing to me your time, and mm -hmm. at some point you might commit to me your money. So at the moment, the onus is on me as a salesperson to give you as much value through the sales interaction as I possibly can. And you, you say that actually to the extent that uh, you can actually create a buying experience that the buyer enjoys. Uh, absolutely. And, uh, and uh, I mean, I guess there's no, we all know it. When we are the customer, we know that we go back to places to buy things when we enjoy the experience. And yet it's kind of strange that a lot of salespeople and sales organizations don't create that experience for their customer when they're selling. And yet, you know, if, if you look at some of the research by um, uh, the Challenger guys, if you, if mm -hmm. you uh, look at their original research, now, I think it was something like 42% of repeat purchases were based nothing to do with the price of the product or the product itself. It was totally and utterly based on, did I get value and enjoy the interaction with the salesperson? 
Yeah, uh, and yet there's, at that point, there's very little training around making sure your customer gets value out of the interaction. It was it was pushing how much they're going to enjoy the the thing they purchased. Yeah. Well, yeah. If you think about all this, the field about customer experience, it really starts after the sale, for the most part. Yeah, uh, and what we're you know what we're saying. So you know, a lot of our clients, uh, we we've got some in traditional retail, some of the some very large ones in traditional retail, but a lot of our clients tend to be in the professional services, mm-hmm. um, where the if you like to say expert industries, where the salesperson, although they probably wouldn't call themselves a salesperson, focuses on showing that they are the best lawyer in town or the best accountant or engineer or whatever it is. And frankly, the person on the other side doesn't really they, – they kind of assume that that's a given that you know how to build a bridge. Well, that's, that's why they're what, talking the, to what, you. Exactly. That, that gets your foot in, in the door. But what, the, what we're trying to get people to do is to say, okay, especially where, with where technology is going so you can, you can get knowledge – on technology, but also the increasing competition across all spheres, you know. So I've now got, even within Australia now, I've got one of the big four accounting firms competing directly with a small company who up until a few years ago sold TVs. And so they're, what they're both trying to do is recognize at the end of the day they need to build a much more trusted relationship with the critical decision makers in the customer uh, organizations that then facilitates buying their gear at some point, whether that gear is legal advice or, um, you know, technology to help their business run more efficiently. So, <laughs> I'm just I'm curious, <laughs> what what is what is the big four accounting firm competing against the company that used to sell TVs? What what piece of business are they competing for? They comp- uh, this, this is a great question, Andy, and I think this is an area that I don't. I'm not sure most uh, organizations have really got their head around, especially at the top end. If you're dealing with the top end of, a, of any organization, be they a small corner shop or a, a, you know, a big bank, when you're dealing with the top executives, to them, their time is more valuable than their money. Mm-hmm. And so you know, the CFO of an organization, for example, only has, let's give them the benefit of the doubt, 10 hours a day. And I, I've, I've interviewed a few of these around the world at the, the, the top end of town, and they're very clear, I will give my time to the person who gives me most return for that time. So if I can sit down with the, one of the um, consultants from the company that sold technology and, or with one of the partners from a big accounting firm, and I have to make a decision which one I give an hour to, I will give my hour to the person who gives me most return for that hour. Yeah, and so what? And so what? We would genuinely to both of those two people say, right? So, how are you going to focus on giving the most value to that person? Well, uh, talk about my stuff. No, no, no. You need to find out what is going on for that person in their world, regardless of what your product is. And so, in theory, both the people going to speak to that person. Once they've done their research, and we talk about you know different ways you can do research, just pest analysis or our own focus five, you start to get patterns of what is important to that CFO. And the person that that CFO will see is the one who believes, based on the introductory email, for example, uh, inviting the meeting, yeah, that's really important to me. That's going to be a really valuable meeting in my world. Yeah, which requires, then, requires a degree of research into the prospect before you send that email. It, it decry, it, into the prospect, absolutely. But I think, again, here there's a slight shift. You know, if I work with a lot of sales organizations, the research they'll do about their prospects is usually about the prospect organization and to a certain extent about the individual. They've got LinkedIn and the like that you can use. What we would say is you've actually got to look at four things. You need to look at the person you're speaking to, what mm-hmm. sort of person they are, what their drivers are, their bonus systems, their relationships internally, the role they have, the business function they sit in, how is that seen politically, what are their budgets like. Um, the organization, but probably mo- as important as any of the others is actually the industry they sit in. So, and I'll, I'll just give you a very quick example. So, so imagine uh, both of these people are trying to build a relationship with someone high up in a bank. What will almost certainly fall out of doing analysis around the industry is there are issues going on for CFOs in banks in Australia that CFOs in banks in the US have already addressed. So the onus then becomes go and find out what those banks in the States did in a similar situation. Don't pretend to be an expert in that, but take that knowledge to this person in the bank in Australia. That is immensely valuable. Mm-hmm. 
And then you build that trust. Now, of course, you can't afford to do this across the whole business community. So the sales organization has to have a very, very tight key account strategy, knowing who their targets are, who their relationships need to be with, and then do it within that. So, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, so you're almost flipping the model on its head. So it's rather than saying, I've got this solution and I need to find a a problem that fits it. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, um, and you know where I'm going on that. Yeah, um, it's, it's it's kind of flipping that over and saying, actually, no, I know who the clients are. I need to have, and I probably need to have a long horizon for that. Let me figure out how I can build relationships at the top there by genuinely adding value to them in every interaction. And Jack Welsh had had a very similar thinking. You know, he was, he was well known within the GE world for roping. If he met someone on the way out of the building, he said, oh, "I'm just going to catch up with John for a cup of coffee." He dragged them back in and said, "No." What's the value in John and having a cup of coffee with them, unless there's something else? Mm-hmm. So, so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a different approach. But what – and I don't know in the States how uh, – what the situation is with this. But one of the basic challenges a lot of organizations we see here and also in Europe face is they actually don't have a really good key account strategy. So – they don't know who their, which clients they want to have three years down the track. They don't know who the key players are in those accounts. What they have is a, an opportunity prospecting strategy, which is very different. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm laughing because I, I, just before I was speaking with you, I was talking to someone else for another interview, and it, it, that was a point that was being made exactly, is that there seems to be a, a problem of really short horizon in sales planning and a business planning, if you will, for sales in too many sales organizations. Yeah. And, you know, I'm surprised if it, usually what triggers a, 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 it more discipline and all of that is a downturn. So in Australia, we've had a boom economy for 24 years, late 2012, the mines turned the taps off because China needed less mm-hmm. stuff out there. So I can understand why there's not much discipline in the systems. And that part of that discipline is having a strategy, key account strategy, following through a strong go, no go process, all that kind of stuff. In the States where you, you kind of hit that tsunami in 2007, you'd have thought that would have triggered in, in most companies, at, at least over probably a two or three year period, an aha moment as to, we really need to get this right. <laughs> Um, and what, what's also we're finding here, and I'd be really interested to find out in your neck of the woods what the situation is. One of the challenges we've got here is the sales managers who are running the sales teams all came through a boom economy. So what they're actually coaching the sales team in is actually poor behavior designed for an older age. Well, yeah, I mean, there's lots of issues, right, that that, that people confront these days. But I think one of the, the solutions that we're seeing here and I think it's it's spreading to Australia as well is you know, moving to this notion of account based selling, account based marketing, account based selling, which is much more uh, strategic at the top level because yep. because you are finding those accounts that are going to have the long term value that you can provide to them. You know, there'll be a long term value on both sides, and and then targeting it with a different sales approach that is about building relationships through a broader segment of contacts within the company as opposed to just sort of you know, trying to find that one person that can open the door for us. Um, Absolutely. And, and so, yeah, I think relationships for the companies that are embracing that and beginning to practice it, then relationships and the relational capital is your relationship capital, as you talk about it, and it starts becoming a little bit more important. It does, and, and I'm finally hearing, I was actually in a conversation yesterday with someone in uh, Perth, and they're saying they're finally finding that the CRM systems, the technology side of things, is getting much better at helping with the, that relationship capital side of things, um, because most CRMs are typically driven by you know the product and the account, but not by the human beings behind the account. Yeah, I think um, they're, and also not by the human beings in the sales organisation. So as soon as your system can make all those connections, it makes it easier to drive a relationship strategy. Well, I think it becomes sort of the final platform that that other tools are using to to help put that information into the CRM system to make it more useful. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's more of a platform play, but, but to your point in, in your book is so, you know, you're saying, Hey, that relationships, 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 and yet, you know, so much of selling, especially in inside sales is about, yeah, I've got my team of inside cadre of inside salespeople. And we're just trying to set up meetings for account execs and so on, which isn't about relationships yeah. at all. Um, and so there's going to be, 
there's going to be an evolution. I think that that's going to occur in this. That's that's going to be really critical as as it gets harder and harder to sustain growth using sort of the conventional inside sales model that a lot of companies use today. So, to a point that you make in your book is that unfortunately a lot of sales training doesn't really, even though it says it talks about relationships, it really doesn't. It doesn't really train people how to build relationships. No, it doesn't. Because uh, again, I think that. Uh, w- what we're talking about is a very behavioral issue, you know, and for anyone to change behavior from whatever it was to whatever you want it to be is a, is a massive thing. And yet very few sales organizations, I think when they come to choose their training provider, look at the whole behavior. So we, we find ourselves probably as much now telling potential clients to not proceed with training because there are an awful lot of other dominoes they need to line up before they go near it if they want to make it effective so what's the first domino they have to line up well the first is the stuff we've been talk- talking about is behavior firstly, change. have a have a business strategy right that'd be a nice thing um have a key account strategy that everyone believes in mm-hmm. have identified long-term market share and um revenue goals and then identify who the really key players are as well as those you know the the technical buyers further down the chain but the really key players are in there and then determine who from your organization needs to build those relationships before you go near anything and then at the back end of it before you start the training make sure you have all your infrastructure in place to embed the learning you know coaches technologies etc etc have your kpis aligned um you know your your promotion systems aligned um have your crm aligned you know, there's one firm over here, I remember years ago, started working with us and at the same time brought in a tool that did nothing but measure pipeline. And I went to the leaders and I said, oh, you, you've got two conflicting messages here and I know which one's going to win. And sure enough, um, they then built a reputation over years of having the best forward book in their industry. Um, but none of it was profit making or real because all any what people were doing were they knew they're going to be judged on the pipeline. So let's fill the pipeline. Sure. It wasn't real. But it was it was there, and so getting all of those pieces aligned, and then you say, right now you're ready to go, and let's not call this training in the middle, shall we? Let's call it something different. Let's call it something to do with empowering your strategy, oh, and let's make this internal, not external. So you call it whatever you want to call it, so it becomes part of your ether in your organisation, mm-hmm. not this ex- external mob running in with a training course, and just with a long tail who'll keep on taking money off you. Just make this part of the way you do things. And what we're, start, we're, seeing, we're seeing in every market, and this isn't down to us, but every market we go to and every industry we go to, things are pretty tough here in Australia at the moment. But in every market, there's one or two outliers who are making extraordinary profits. And yet all their competition is really struggling. And when you get down underneath the, the sheets to find out what it is, is they've really got a culture in their organization, across the organization from new graduate right to the top of the tree, we are here to build relationships in the marketplace. That's our job. Yeah, we still got to sell stuff. <laughs> um, so, I mean, your your book may be one of the only sales books I've read that quotes Carl Jung. And um, <laughs> so, and that, that leads off a chapter about how the customer understanding how the customer really sees you, which is yeah. uh, such a critical element of this, you know, about perception. So, um, you know, what were your, you know, what are the sort of key steps you take to to shape these perceptions? Okay, so uh, I'll just give you a couple of really simple examples. I think uh, anyone listening to this will be able to affiliate to. You know, one of the first things a lot of salespeople say in a meeting with a new prospect is, "So, what is your biggest challenge?" Okay, and it's and it's intended as a really good question. Okay, it's intended as a really good question. In in those behaviours we talk about, we, we talk about eight different behaviours. So one of those is opportunity fear. So on one end of the scale, you believe a uh, very high opportunity score means you believe everything's all going to w- work out. It's great, life's great, it'll be fantastic. Yeah. Other end of the scale, incredibly risk averse, negative thinking, fear driven. That question, what's your biggest challenge, works really well for someone who's in, who, who likes the fear side of things because that's the world they live in. Most you're, CEOs... You're saying, you're, saying for, you're saying a great question for the sales rep or for the customer, for the buyer? The sales rep asks it. It's a great question for a customer who sits at that low end of the scale mm-hmm. because they, they, they're comfortable with challenge and negative. 
most CEOs around are actually the opposite end of the scale. So they live in a world of opportunity. That's why they are the CEO. They have to look forward. Someone of that type hearing what's your biggest challenge, and I can say this very personally, you know, we score 180, I score 160 in opportunity. The first time someone says to me, what's your biggest challenge? I genuinely, every fiber of my body wants that person gone because I, they're, they're trying to take me to a dark world I do not like being in. Why do I want to spend time with someone like that? So it's the salesperson needs to understand that is their tendency is to go into that negative. They need to ask a couple of questions that start the conversation with me or with someone like me that they realize, ah, this is a guy who lives in a positive world. I need to change that question around. And so they might ask me instead of what's your biggest challenge, they might say, how's business going? And I'll say, fantastic. They say, what's going best? I'll say this. And they say, of all those things that are going really well, could any go any better? Absolutely. But they're not dragging me into that negative world. Well, and this, and is, that, this is really interesting because I'm a huge believer and advocate for, yeah, I hate the question, what's your pain point? And I think it's a, yeah. I think it's a useless question in the most case. Because, again, as you said, <laughs> CEOs, uh, and not just CEOs, people that are, have responsibility for a certain outcome are thinking about you know, a more aspirational level, not a pain avoidance level. Absolutely. And it, it was really interesting. I've, I, I've been doing some interviews of my own for some stuff we're doing, and I did two yesterday for people who've been through our material years ago, actually. And both of them said one of the most impactful things that have changed the way that, that they interact with their clients in the first ever meeting and also the impact it's had on their revenues and their careers is when they ask one of those ridiculously aspirational questions right at the start. And I'll just give you an example of a, quite a brave one. Um, this is a, a lay, uh, female engineer. And she says she now starts nearly every meeting with a question that's quite similar, which is along the lines of, so imagine it's 10 or 20 years down the track. What do you want to be telling your grandchildren about that building you're about to build? <laughs> that's yeah. awesome. That's a great question. <laughs> I love it. Uh, and, and, but how, and she says that she's convinced the reason she has such incredible success with it is everyone else who goes and meets these clients is going, so what's your pain point? What's your biggest challenge? How? Demotivational is that? <laughs> well, a, a simple, a simple example a way to you know talk about aspirations is sort of same thing as, as say, okay, well, yeah, you know, where do you want to be? Let's say three years from now, and yeah. where are you today? And suddenly, absolutely, you don't even have to ask the next question because the customer will ask it for you. They'll say, okay, well, here's this gap between where we want to be and where we are. That's the issue, right? And, and we're exactly on the same page here. And, and, and for me, the interesting thing is as soon as you. So that, that three-year question, so um, you know, the three-year horizon, the five-year horizon is brilliant. And you can ask that very early in any conversation. The reason why most salespeople, most people, not just salespeople, don't ask it is partly they haven't thought about it, but partly they have no idea what the answer is going to be. And that's why it's a great question. But that's actually quite terrifying to the salesperson. Because, oh, God, what if they start talking about stuff that I don't know anything about? Yeah, but instead of saying, which I always did in those environments, it's like, oh, cool. You know, I learned something new, <laughs> right? I mean, this Absolutely. Is, to me, that was, that was the most, that was why I was in sales in the first place. Is no, ab ab absolutely, Andy. And so for me, and I think it's again, it'd be, it'd be quite interesting. I don't know how you how you do any research on this. I think one of the things that's, that we've kind of drummed out of people is curiosity. Yes. You know, I, I love, you know, I, I can remember just being fascinated by a guy I met in uh, Shanghai when I lived there. And he said, yeah, what I do is I'll make, you know, you know, those video cassettes. I said, yeah. He said, you know, the black flap at the front. I said, yeah. And I said, so he said, inside that black flap, there's a tiny little piece of metal. There's a spring. I said, yeah. He said, that's what I make. <laughs> 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 and I'll make a lot of them. <laughs> but you, you, once people, and, and, and again, the, I think the higher up you get up organizations, the more they want to talk about their business. Yeah, oh, well, absolutely. So, so don't pretend to know more than you do. You'll never know more than you, your client does about their own business. But Well, I think that's because you know, that. part of the issue is we've become so scripted in many cases. Yeah. That, and I think sometimes the scripts, there's a tendency for organizations to, not all, but some, to say, well, we've, we've you know, laid out the playbook, we've got the script, we're going to train our people to the script. But I'd rather say, God, I want to train my people to understand the customer. And forget the script. If they understand the customer and their business, 
then they'll ask this question and they will be prepared for the answer even if they've never heard it before because they understand the business they'll be able to come up with a good follow-on question yeah but i you know i I think andy that one of the and i I know this you know i've worked with a very large organization out of boston as well as in, in a number of different parts of the world what a lot of organizations even when they get their head in this space about and they get really into yep this is what we need our sales team to be doing absolutely wrestle to find people who are good at it and i think we're actually rallying against an education system here because certainly over here in the uk my background the education system is almost by rote and those who succeed in the education system are not those who are used to asking good questions they use those used to giving detailed answers mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so if that has you know if you from the age of four or five you've just become really good at giving answers the chance of you suddenly at the age of 35 or 40 being able to flip that round you know you can do it but it's a long stretch for a lot of people and, and we're, we're finding in most sales organizations now there's probably 10 or 20 percent who are doing it naturally anyway mm-hmm. there's probably 10 or 20 percent at the bottom who will never get there either they, they can't or they don't want to right and then there's a whole batch in the middle who can, but it's going to take a lot of work. And that's why I said earlier, you know, the, it's so critical that the firm, the organization has all their other pieces aligned around the behavior they really want and don't just hope the behavior is going to happen. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point is, is if you're undertaking a, an initiative in behavior change, which is you know, behavior change, we're talking about the fundamental behaviors of sales, is, yeah, they don't take place in a vacuum. They take place as part of a process or a structure, as you talked about. And so once they're ready to implement and practice and hopefully inculcate those behaviors into a habit, then they've got a system in which to use it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Interesting. Yeah, I love that point about the opportunities versus pain. And then when you talk about trust as well, as one of your core behaviors, you you have this tool you call an octagon. You talk about your score yeah. on your octagon score, uh, which you can tell people in a few minutes uh, where they can find out more about that. But um do you have sort of a less conventional view of trust? I mean, you're talking about trust really about as a salesperson ceding control, which is, yeah, is, is, is tough for them. It is tough for them because especially when all not, their insul- not, not that they have any control to begin with. That, I mean, they have the illusion no, that they, they have the they illusion of control. It. Absolutely. Then they try and take it. And, you know, if you look at a lot of Rackham's work, you know, the whole, um, Spin and, and he says this himself. Yeah. He says it himself that, you know, the architecture he designed in those days was designed around selling Xerox photocopiers in a day when the salesperson could take control because the customer didn't know any better. Well, they didn't have a place and, to, they didn't have an alternative place to go. Well, yeah, absolutely. If you go back, maybe it's probably about 15 years ago. He said that that architecture is, is long gone because, the customer now has the has all control, and increasingly so with, with technology and the like. Um, but a lot of sales systems and methodologies, um, as, as I said earlier, they're, they're kind of talking about relationship, but essentially they're still um, a solution looking for a problem that fits. Um, the trust for us is, and Maester, you know, David Maester's stuff uh, in the Trust Advisor is absolutely mm-hmm. spot on as far as we're concerned. You know, his, his trust equation, I think it's a, it would be really a really nice, simple tool for most salespeople to ask their customers is, please score me on these four different variables. Um, and what the customer will nearly always say is, high on credibility, moderate on reliability. What do you mean by intimacy? And really high on self-orientation because the salesperson goes in there and takes control. And what Mesa says and we're saying is, no, no, you know, trust and control are opposite sides of the same coin. Uh, and the analogy I make, which is kind of trite, but uh, people hopefully will, will understand what I say. When I get back from a business trip, if I walk up to my wife and say, honey, do you fancy going out for a Chinese meal tonight? I'm taking control. If you look at the Honey and Mumford research way back in the 70s, there's, I think they said it's something like an 80 odd percent chance that my wife will rebut me in one way or another. Now, she's not rebutting the fact that she doesn't want Chinese. She's rebutting the fact that I've taken control. Mm-hmm. Whereas if instead when I get home, I say to her, what do you fancy doing tonight? I think there's something like a 60% chance that she will say, I don't know. What do you fancy? And that's that dynamic of me giving her control by asking her what she wants. And immediately she reciprocates by giving it back to me. 
because she doesn't feel controlled. You know, the, I, I don't know, I don't know about you, Andy, but I, I know very few people who like to be sold to, but I know an awful lot of people who like to buy things. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the, the reason we don't like to be sold to is the salesperson's taking control of us. That's very interesting. Once yeah. they stop this. <laughs> yeah, so, so it, it, it is simple in concept, but actually in execution for a salesperson, it can be quite hard. Um, especially when sitting behind them is all this, these systems pressurizing them on how many calls to make, what their numbers are and all this thing. And so what we're saying in that world is incredibly counterintuitive. Um, and that's why I go back to what I said earlier. You you have to have a strategy that cuts down the number of calls, the number of meetings, the number of organizations and people you need to cut contact, spend more time on fewer and you'll get a much greater success rate. Oh, I agree, hundred percent. And also, if <laughs> you have to take the the fear out of it, I mean, the control comes from fear. Yeah. Right. The salesperson wants to be in control because they're afraid that if they're not in control, then you know it's not going to turn into an opportunity. Yeah, you know, they think uh, they, absolutely. Yeah, and they've been taught over time that the only way to make things happen is to be in control. I mean, you can Google controlling the sales process, and I talk about this in one of my books, and you get <laughs> thirty one million returns. <laughs> it's like. Yeah, for something that's a complete illusion. I mean, you're never in control. So, no. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Uh, Keith, we get into the last segment of the show here, and I've got some standard questions I ask all my guests. And uh, the first one is actually a hypothetical scenario. And in this hypothetical scenario, you, Keith, have just been hired as the new vice president of sales for a company whose sales have stalled out. Time to hit the reset button. CEO, the board, very anxious for sales to uh, get back on track. So what two steps could you take your first week on the job that could have the biggest impact? Wow. Uh, first two steps. The, the two things I'd want to achieve really quickly is assess the sales force um, and assess the, everything else in the organization that supports and drives that sales force behavior. Um, there's a third one that I'd really want to get in as well if I was going to be naughty and that would be to understand the customer's perceptions of our view of reality <laughs> okay love the way you phrase that alright well that's a good answer very succinct so uh, now I've got some more rapid fire questions you can give me one word answers if you wish or elaborate uh, the first one is when you Keith are out selling your services what's your most powerful sales attribute uh, curiosity Who's your sales role model? Uh, sales role model. Actually, it's, it's, someone, it's not someone in the public domain. He's a guy called Alan Ross, who was my mentor for years uh, in Asia. Okay. Uh, what's Besides your own, what's one book every salesperson should read? Challenger. Which one? Sale or uh, customer? Uh, customer. I agree. I think that's a better book. Um, All right. Last question for you. Always a tough one for people. Uh, What music is on your playlist these days? Oh, my God. I haven't moved since 1977. (laughs) All right. I wish you were here. Bat out of hell. Uh, Rumor. Bat out of hell. Okay. (laughs) Rumor. Okay. Gosh. Got some classics there. So Fleetwood Mac, Meatloaf. All right. Good stuff. Yeah. Some Floyd in there. Pink Floyd. Excellent. Nothing wrong with that at all. All right. Well, Keith, I want to thank you for joining us today. Tell folks how they can connect with you and and learn more about what you do. Excellent. How do they connect with me? Uh, If they go to www.boft.com, they'll get links to all the LinkedIn and blogs and newsletters we do. If they're interested in the the profiling tool, um, the links are in there as well, or they can go just go to onlineoctagon.com. It's free. It doesn't cost anything. Um, all, All the information's there. Those are probably the two best contact points. We're about to uh, actually roll out an online learning uh, program, which we're really excited and, I guess, nervous is the uh, <laughs> fair thing to say. <laughs> well, so, people um, listening, uh, they'll uh, hopefully go and get in touch and learn more about that. So, again, thank you for being on the show. And, uh, friends, thank you for taking time out of your day to listen to Accelerate. And remember, make it a part of your daily routine to deliberately learn something new every day to help you accelerate your success. And easy way to do that is take a minute and subscribe to this podcast, Accelerate. That way you won't miss any of my conversations with top business experts like my guest today, Keith Dugdale, who shared his experience about how to accelerate the growth of your business. 
So thanks for joining me. And until next time, this is Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard and want to make sure you don't miss any upcoming episodes, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Stitcher.com. For more information about today's guest, visit my website at andypaul.com.